will start here in about one minute. Thanks for coming. say hi. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. We're really excited to talk about Google today. Mickey, you typically don't care to talk much about Google though, do you? I like Google just a little bit. Right, so everyone who's in there, make sure to ask questions or comment in the chat area if you wish. Note also that we are recording this, um, so we'll be able to play it back at another time. Also, I have with me Jill Bates. Hi, everybody. I'll be uh, manning the chat box uh, during the first part of this webinar. And so if you see a message from ESU8, that'll be me typing in there. All right, let's get started. All of us attended a Google Summit this summer in Lincoln, and I believe it was the third Google Summit. Third Google uh, I, I Summit. believe it was, mm -hmm. yes. And it's well worth the time and money. And it's just sort of, a, and they didn't ask us to do this. This is just us passing on some of our favorite things that we heard. And also probably just to put a plug in for it. I see Jill drinking out of her Google Summit coffee mug right now. That probably wasn't planned, was it? That wasn't planned, no. Okay, let's get started. I'm going to start with uh, a poll. So I'm going to drag in a poll here. And I'm going to open the poll. All right, so I want you to answer this for me. And I'll make it a, just a little bigger in case some of you can't see it. Okay, do you like to stay organized by having your notes in one place? And your options are, yes, organization is good. No, I prefer spending time searching for my notes. I enjoy that. Or I guess I've never thought of it. And there are the results. And most of us like to be organized. So my first tip, I'm going to hide this poll now. My first tip is about being organized. So I'm going to cover something that I, when I heard it at the Google Summit, I, I thought, that was it. That was my tip, and I could leave now. You know, it was it was sufficient. Um, it was just one of those tips that, because I attend a lot of meetings, and I'm always looking for those meeting notes. Jill, have you done that? Oh yes, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, so table of contents that isn't anything great, but it's how to do it, and just that you can do it. I guess is what I love. So I, I, my first slide here says, first of all, why would you do that? So I'm asking these questions and asking that you think about it. Do you have committee meetings or meetings that are ongoing? Uh, perhaps there are PLCs and so on. Or maybe it's just your curriculum. Or maybe it's a class syllabus or whatever. And we take a lot of notes in Google Docs. And if you're listening to this, maybe you're a Google user. You have Google Docs notes here. You have Google Docs notes there. And this way you can just make one long document that seems a little bit daunting, but when you make a table of contents, you can quickly get to a certain area within this long um, streaming note uh, from all of your meetings. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So picture, if you will, here. I'm going to pull up my arrow here. And I have a long list of notes. And the notes go on and on and on and on and on and on. Okay, And I want to create a table of contents. So down here at the bottom with this red, where this red arrow is, where I'm putting the green arrow there now, this is my new topic within my notes. And, and I want to be able to get to this. Okay? So first thing I'll do is highlight it. Okay? That's step one, is to highlight. Second step, I'm going up to format, and I'm going to drop down to paragraph styles. Okay? And with paragraph styles open, I'm going to move over, and I have to choose one of the headings. Personally, I haven't tried out heading two, three, or four, and actually I do think that they work, but I've always just used heading one. And then I have to slide over and choose apply heading one. Okay? So that's really what you have to do. You have to have something that, you know, to think, I want to be able to click at the top of my long list of notes and my table of contents, 
and I want it to go all the way down to a certain area within these notes. So paragraph styles, heading one, and apply heading one. And then when I do that, you can see in my example here, these are all the notes that I took that day at the Google Summit. And as I went to various sessions, I made, I added this individual session to my notes. So if I wanted to quickly jump down to the Iron Chef, which was blogger versus, um, I, for, I forget what that was because I, I cut it off, or best practices and how to go paperless. I just simply click on this and it jumps right down to my notes. I don't have to spend time scrolling or looking for it, Jill. That's awesome because usually in the past when we've taken notes, we put the headings in there, but we don't make the table of contents and then we have to scroll and scroll and scroll to get to right. the final thoughts. Right, or Google A to Z or whatever. Right. So I'm going to go back one. So remember my new topic here? And I was just calling it that so you could see it. So I typed in a new topic. Then I went through format, paragraph styles, heading, heading one. And then up at the top, then this shows up. So now with all of these notes that I've taken throughout two days, I don't have to scroll down there. I just simply click at the top of my uh, document. And there you have it. And then it looks... Um, it just continues to add as I, and then if I want to get rid of one of those, I can simply just um, go down to the bottom and take it out or change that paragraph style and things like that. I'd like to add that we're using this um, with monthly meetings that we have here at the service unit, and so our table of contents is a list of the dates of our meetings, and it's just working so slick. It's wonderful. That was Corey's idea, and it's really a great way to use a table of contents if you have like a curriculum meeting. Um, or a teacher meeting and you meet regularly, you can organize your document that way. Right. So th that's really been one of my favorites. Yeah, and Mickey typed in, in there, yes. I was very excited. Just because, you know, if you have something that can keep you organized better, I think that's a plus. It's a bonus. All right, next. Here's another tip I learned there. I think I knew this before, but it was one of my favorites again. Um, uh, it's regarding research. So picture yourself researching something. Maybe you're the student or you're the, or you're the teacher and you're in your Google Docs. So you can do research without having to open up another tab, perhaps another browser, and jump back and forth. So I'm in my Google document right now, and I'm looking, and I'm researching. So I go up to Tools, and then I just click on Research. And what it does is it pulls up over on the side here another window where I can search right here within the document. Then as I'm doing, oh, here, here's a screenshot. So I might be in my notes here, and then, and then uh, it just comes up over on the right-hand side. So you can search images or whatever the case is, and it's right within it. So now my next slide here, this is one I really like. So when I click on a picture, I just Googled the word table. So I just simply drug the picture of the table into my document. What I want you to notice right here where my green arrow is, is it does what? It annotates it for you. And then down at the bottom, this is just a screenshot now, down at the bottom of my page, it, it gives um, the link, So, which is a good digital citizenship thing to do, is to always give credit where you got it. Note also that I was searching when I did this under uh, free to use again. Mm -hmm. So I did research this and make sure that it wasn't copywritten. So there's a digital citizenship thing there, one, in searching for images that you can use, and two, as soon as I drag it in, Google does this for me. I didn't have to do this. It puts the one here by the picture, wherever it is in your document, and at the bottom of that page, it puts a link back to it. That is a great tool for students who are doing research and are asked to insert photographs or pictures into their document. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to transition now so I don't take too much time. Next up, we have uh, Mickey, and Mickey is going to... Uh, talk about a variety of things. So I'm going to turn the mic over to her. Uh, thank you, Corey. And um, this was my first uh, Great Plains Google Summit. I had been to a Google Summit in Wisconsin several years ago, but this was the first opportunity for me to go to the Lincoln Summit. And my main purpose in going to the Lincoln Summit was to attend as many sessions as I could on the admin panel. Um, Norfolk, and we just rolled out uh, 1,200 Chromebooks to our senior high students, so grades 9 through 12. And um, while we had a pilot Chromebook program going last year, um, we really wanted to make sure that we were managing these devices 
um, as best we could. And so they brought in um, one speaker that all he talked about was the admin panel. So I sat in one room for two days and listened to basically one speaker. And because that was really what I wanted to get out of this um, session. So what we kind of learned some different things. I also had a tech guy that went with me. And so we sat in these sessions and kind of talked back and forth, making sure we had everything set up and ready to go when we rolled out these devices. So I've just given you, if you haven't, um, if you're not an administrator um, and you don't have access to the admin panel, I've just given you a quick screenshot here of some of the different features within this console. Um, one of the newer features is the ability to pull out reports to see how your users are utilizing Google Apps for Education. And over on the right-hand side there, you can see we have 2,634 active users with 7,000 some docs created. And the reporting feature is a really nice feature within the dashboard that you can get lots of great information um, based on how your users are using, are actually making use of Google Apps for Education. And on the next slide, um, I showed you how Norfolk has chosen to divide up our users. Um, we have some organizational units, and I've given you a screenshot of the different organizational units that we have created. Uh, for our staff, we have our staff in one organizational unit, and um, they, their address, email address, ends in npsne.org. And we have students underneath that, and their email address is students.npsne.org. And then for our students, we have them divided in organizations based on their graduation year. By doing it, by separating it this way, we can apply certain features or certain apps and extensions, which I'm going to talk about next, to just our students. And we can even further separate that based on class. So at Norfolk, um, all of our students, K-12, have Google accounts. Um, and we manage those differently. So for example, K-3, through three, um, we have them have a Google account, but they don't have the Gmail portion of it turned on. So they can use Drive, and they can create documents and slides, presentations and so on, but they can't email. Four through six, grades four through six, we have email enabled, but they can only email within our domain. So at that grade level, we're trying to teach good digital citizenship skills, proper email etiquette. So we've, we've um, only restricted those emails to come within the domain. So they can email teachers, they can email their classmates, but they can't send or receive email from outside of our domain. And then for 7 through 12, um, we have it open. So they can email inside and outside of the domain. And by establishing different organizational units, we're able to make those um, restrictions based on their graduation year. And the last thing I'm going to talk about in the um, apps dashboard, um, a lot of people ask us, which apps and extensions are you pushing out to your students? And with our Chromebook one-to-one -one program, um, we right now, I, actually this number has changed. I added two more apps today. But so we push about 30 apps and extensions to our students. And we can manage that through our um, the admin console. And um, we can also we can choose which ones they can have access to. So while they can see the Chrome Web Store, students on our Chromebooks are not allowed to load, install, or download any apps or extensions themselves. They can only access what we give them access to. We so have nice. three. Go ahead. I was just saying that's really nice to know if people are listening to this that you can control these things. Or if you're a new Google Apps for Ed school just knowing that you can do those sorts of things. And you still can control what it is that the students do on those machines. Oh, absolutely. And I'm just giving you a very small portion of what you can do within this admin console. But it's very customizable so that you can give your students access to specific things through the console. Um, the, we have three apps that are pinned, which when they log into their Chromebook, these three apps appear down at the Chrome launcher, which is kind of like the taskbar that you would see on a Windows machine. Um, Gmail, Google Drive, and Google Classroom. Um, and I just added Google Classroom because um, we're seeing pretty heavy use here at the high school, and we want our students to be able to quickly and easily access that. So you can also um, determine how their, basically how their desktop looks. 
um, through the, um, the admin panel. Since you mentioned Google Classroom, I'm going to take that opening um, and just ask you, how is that going? It's only been a couple weeks. What are you hearing from teachers? What are you hearing from students regarding Google Classroom? Just a real short synopsis of what you're seeing and hearing. Well, Google Classroom has been a godsend to some of our teachers. For some of our teachers who are not as technology proficient, they have absolutely embraced Google Classroom. It makes communicating with your students and sharing documents with your students easier than it ever was. So Google Classroom replaces like about 10 different steps that you had to go through in order to share a folder or share a document with your students. And it makes um, collecting those documents, you know, so at the high school we may have teachers that have 120, 130 kids throughout the day. And to try and navigate through 130 different student folders to find assignments was a nightmare. And Google Classroom makes that super simple. So even for our non-techie teachers, they have absolutely embraced it. And some of our, our more techie teachers are like, is it really this simple? The interface is super clean and simple. It's just, it's just a beautiful product. Thank you for that. All right, we'll keep moving. I, I appreciate that input, Mickey. Absolutely. And then I, people ask us all the time, what apps and extensions do you push out? These are the apps and extensions that we are currently pushing out to our students. Obviously, all of the Google products, um, but these are either apps that, and extensions that I have used that I think our kids can use or that apps and extensions that teachers have requested. Um, so you can see over on the right-hand side, we've got several math um, apps that our math department wants, including GeoGebra and Plotly, Desmos Graphing Calculator. Um, so those are apps specifically requested by our uh, math department. But that, that just gives you a snapshot of some of the things that we are distributing to our students. Perfect. Perfect. All right, Pear Deck, this is now time once again for a poll. And let me drag this in here just briefly and get it sized. And I'll open the poll. Have you ever heard of Pear Deck? Your answers are, or choices are, pears. I love pears. Yes, I've heard of it, or no, I haven't heard of it. So, Mickey, I love this when we do webinars. You're talking to a bunch of people who haven't heard of it, so give us a brief overview of what Pear Deck is. Well, as I mentioned, I went to mostly um, presentations that dealt with the admin panel. Well, this was the last session of day two, and this was a... Um, it was, it, the Pear Deck was released in beta last spring, and I got an early beta invite to it probably in April of last year, and I was just blown away with what this product can do. It's actually um, put together by uh, uh, some teachers in Iowa, um, are some of the people that are behind this. But basically, if you're familiar with Socrative, and you're familiar with Nearpod, and those are two apps that work both on Chromebook and iPads and all sorts of devices, any web-enabled device. It's kind of a mashup of both of those things. So you, a teacher can build a presentation, and they can make it interactive by launching all sorts of um, quiz questions and polls and responses. And because it integrates with Google Drive, all of this is incorporated in Google Drive. And when a kid logs in, um, unlike Socrative, where they get a choice of putting in the name that they want, the, their Google credentials are logging them into Pear Deck. So there's no silly usernames, and you're trying to figure out which kid was which person that they entered in their username. It, it, it takes their Google Apps username. And so you see immediately which kid um, has been into your, into your classroom. Um, on the next slide, I've just given you a screenshot of a couple of the different how you can use this. So for example, um, maybe we're posing a question to our students. Where did early civilization develop? On the left, you see what it looks to the classroom. And on the right is what you see each student will see on their screen. They get to pinpoint where they think early civiliz civilization developed. So you could put up a map um, on the, the next screenshot, or the, the Magellan, uh, what route did Magellan take? So you're surveying your kids. Do they understand the route that Magellan takes? And they can draw on that map indicating where they think the route Magellan took was. Um, so those are just some, some 
simple uses, but you can um, gauge how your kids are understanding what you're presenting. And you could put up a, a thumbs up and a thumbs down, and they can move a dot between the thumbs up and thumbs down so you can gauge whether or not the majority of your kids in class are understanding the information that you're talking about right then and there. And uh, if we were doing this live in Pear Deck, the teacher has the ability to click on each of those dots or click on each of those lines and see which student drew that line or put that dot there. It just, it gives, there's some awesome reporting features in here. I just am so impressed with Pear Deck. Now, they have gone to a pricing structure, but you still can sign up for a free account and utilize that. The pricing structure gives you a, an extreme, break, a extreme price break for the education versions. It is well worth a look. I, I love Socrative. I love Nearpod. And this is just that mashed up into one pairness goodness, googly goodness of a product. I, I just was, I, I just am so impressed with this product. That's great. It sounds like it's very engaging for the students too. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the kids can't be off task. I mean, they've got to be keyed into what you're talking about, and they get to actually engage in that. Instead, of, and for some of those kids who are afraid to to raise their hand and ask a question, you know, a tool like this which gives them a little bit of anonymity in that they're not, you know, visually raising their hand, um, you know, can get some of those quieter kids really involved in your classroom. Wonderful. Thank you for that. I appreciate hearing of that. And then also for someone who's used it. Now, are you using it district-wide? We are not as of yet. Um, we've had a lot of things going on here in the district, and I have yet to schedule some of my training sessions yet, but Pear Deck is definitely on my list to, to show our teachers. Okay. We're going to move on, thank you, Mickey, to Jill. She has some Gmail tips and tricks. One of my favorite sessions that I went to was advanced tips and tricks. And so I'm just going to give you a couple different um, tips that I learned about using Gmail. And I love this one um, because I bet many of you have um, trouble with email. Either you've sent something before you wanted to send it, or you've realize that you forgot to um, attach a document. So um, have you ever sent an email and immediately realized you forgot the attachment? I have done this. I've done that too. I've done that a lot. So the first uh, tip that I want to tell you about is called undo send. So when you are in your Gmail, if you choose the little gear up in the upper right hand corner, and then from the drop-down menu, you will select Settings. Okay, so when you're into Settings, then you'll see um, a bar across the top, General, Labels, etc. You'll go over to Labs and click on Labs. Once you've done that, a new screen will appear. And um, you can go in there and you can search for something within the lab. Now, Labs are testing grounds and so um, this is where people can go in and kind of experiment with um, different different options that you can use. I searched for undo send and there is an available lab with that name so if you notice over on the right hand uh, portion of that screen you want to make sure that you have selected enable and then that enables undo send. It's, it's an awesome thing. Then you will go back to your regular settings. Okay, so we'll, from going to, we'll be in labs. We're going to go back to general. Okay, I'll move that back up there. See okay. general there? Okay. So you're back in general. And then if you look down the page, you can see that undo send is in your list. Now the default is that you have 10 seconds to undo it. I like a little more than that, so I, I have selected 30 seconds for my undo send. So you just go into that little menu, choose the little arrows, select if you want 5, 10, 20, or 30 seconds. After you've made your selection, you need to scroll all the way to the bottom of that page and click save, okay? Or um, I can't think what the name of, it's not save, but uh, something like save, okay. So then when you send a message within Gmail, after you've hit sent, this little message will pop up at the top of your screen. It says your message has been sent and you have an option. You can undo it or you can view the message. And that 
screen will stay there for 30 seconds. After you send it, then you'll get a little uh, yellow bar that says your message has been sent. I have used this option more than once. I um, was unsure of something, so I went back in and viewed my message, and I saw a misspelled word. So I quickly undid my message, and um, I, I think this is a really good one to use. Um, another tip and trick that I used is um, about attachments. And on this one, um, if you include the words attached is, Gmail will automatically identify that you mean to have an attachment. And so uh, on my example, um, in my message I said attached is a document, I hit send, and I got this message. It seems like you forgot to attach a file. You wrote attached is in your message, but there are no files attached. Send anyway. Okay, that is genius. Mickey, anyone else yeah. who is listening or as we're recording this, think about that. Absolutely, yeah. I love that feature, and I, it, that saved me more than one time. Yeah, yeah. I love, I, it. I love this one because it saved me also a few times. So um, that's one of my favorite tips and tricks. Um, I also went to a session that I really loved that was on Google Maps. And this isn't a Google product, but um, the man who was speaking to us is a, a social studies teacher, and he uses this website with his classes. It's called geoguesser.com. And what happens when you click on Let's Play is that it brings up a screen um, that will show you something in Google Earth. And you can uh, move around, you know, within Google Earth. You can do your 360 view. You can move down the road. And what you try to do is to guess where you are. So you could put this up on the screen. When students come in, they could look at it. They could guess what part of the world are you in. And when you make your guess, which is the next screen, I looked at this and I guessed that it was in Missouri. Okay? I saw a sign that said Carthage. How did you do? And I thought Carthage was in Missouri. Well, let's see how I did. Actually, it was in Mississippi. So I was only 445 miles off. But I have been as much as thousands of miles off because I chose something in the United States, and it was actually over in Eastern Europe. So um, this is really fun. And then you can play the next round. You get points. Just kind of a good way for students to uh, use Google Maps or Google Earth and realize that different parts of the world look very identical to where we live. Another and, Google uh, map that I learned. Was before before you go on, Jill, I, I just want to warn people that GeoGuessr is totally addicting because um, it is, it's a lot of fun because Jill's right. It looks like it could be in the United States and you find out that it's in Africa. So it's a great, it's, it's, it's a fun, fun, addicting game. That's awesome. It is a fun one. I'll go really quickly through this. We just have a couple of minutes. Um, I also really enjoyed the information on Google Maps Lite, where you can create customized maps. I'm going to have Corey go to the next slide. And what I've done here is selected Add Line or Shape, and I've just drawn the perimeter around the state of Nebraska, around Greenland, and around China. Okay. What happens then if you select that uh, perimeter is that it shows you the square miles and um, the miles of your perimeter that you have drawn. That's kind of cool, um, I think, for students to realize that you know Nebraska has about this many square miles and about that much in the, per uh, the perimeter. Then you can choose a measurement tool. And um, I simply started in Norfolk. I flew as the crow flies to North Platte. Then I flew to Lincoln. And then I flew back to Norfolk. I traveled almost 500 miles. And I covered almost 9,000 square miles. So you can do measurements from Norfolk to Minneapolis or Norfolk to Washington, DC, very, very easily within your map. But probably my favorite part of Google Maps Lite is this next one. If you choose the hand, which is the select tool, you can move your map. Now, we're used to looking at these maps on the wall that make Greenland look huge. But 
those maps on the wall distort how the Earth actually looks. If we had a globe and we took the globe apart, Greenland would not be nearly that big. So when I drew uh, or drug Nebraska up to the Greenland, up to the northern part, you can see how big it made Nebraska. I drug my China map over to the United States, and those are very, fairly parallel, so there's not much difference in the shape there. But when I drug Greenland down and put it over China, you can see how small it looks. It's amazing. When, it, when it's down on that part of the earth. I loved that, and I thought that would be a really great tool for working with kids. Because it looks huge up here, and it's really not, right? Yeah. Um, I, the, another session that I went to was on Google Draw. If you want to learn more about this, come to our Google workshop that we have scheduled at ESU 8 on Thursday, October 2nd. Um, you can learn things about drawing timelines, using custom uh, colors. There's just a lot of really fun stuff that you can learn within Google Draw. Ah, is there a cost to this, or is it free to our ESU 8 people? I think it's free to our ESU 8 people. All right, so be sure and get signed up for that. We are at the end. Next week, I wanted to put a plug in quick for Heidi. Uh, she's doing a, a C4L um, webinar. It's recorded next week, and she'll play it. Um, she's going to talk about what's new, and then also if you're a brand new user, it'll also be appropriate for you. So that is next week at 345. Thank you on behalf of Mickey and Jill and myself. We appreciate you coming. Thanks, Mickey. Thank you for having me.